everyone from Lola, Montana, Dunrobin Ranch. This is Suzanne Miller, the owner. And uh, I like to uh, kind of do a deep dive in some of the birds that come to Dunrobin. And this last week, I've been noticing the starlings, of course, since we put the bird feeders up on the nest, um, the osprey's nest, we've been getting a lot of starlings. And, and I know these guys have a bad rap, but I think they're very interesting regardless. I am keeping my eye on the chat, so um, make sure that if you have any questions or you have any uh, comments to add, uh, please uh, go to the um, Monday socials on Friends of Dunrovin and chat there so that I can see your chats. Okay, so this is a photo of a starling I took just yesterday on our nest. And when I first got to Montana, you know, I hadn't really seen starlings because, I, well, number one, I didn't notice birds nearly as much as I did once I moved back to Montana from Alaska. But while Alaska has starlings, they don't have them in the same numbers that Montana does, and they just haven't made an impression on me. And so the first time I saw one at our bird feeders, I got really excited because it was during the summer month, and it was those beautiful iridescent colors that um, starlings have, like excitedly called my husband and he moaned and groaned and rolled his eyes and said oh Suzanne that's just a starling and that was my first clue that starlings were not the darlings of the bird world and oh, why is that well let's take a look why it is uh, first of all they're not native to North America they are native to Europe and the way they got to North America is in the 1890s, a group of Shakespearean fans in New York City uh, decided that Central Park had to have all the birds that Shakespeare mentioned in his literature. And the one, one of the ones that was missing was the starling, the European starling or common starling. And so they introduced 100 starlings into Central Park in New York City in the 1800s, 1890s, and look at what's happened to them since. And if you look at the worldwide distribution of sterlings, you see that indeed they're European originally, that's the blue colored dots, and they were introduced wherever the British went, uh, Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. So they really followed the Brits um, across the world. Um, so let's take a look at starlings. Um, first of all, they eat uh, a wide variety of things. They eat uh, grasshoppers, beetles, flies, seeds, caterpillars, all kinds of insects, but also earthworms and other invertebrates. But they also eat berries and fruits and seeds. And this is what gets them into big trouble with people in agriculture in places like the United States and Canada because they will decimate fields uh, if big flocks uh, come into a field of starlings. And this is one of the things about starlings is you ne almost never find one at a time. And I think the names of the, the flocks, the, the names that have been given to flocks really tells you a lot about um, people's um, uh, thought thoughts of them and what they do a chattering for example um, clearly these birds are very noisy and they have a very wide range of vocalizations in fact they can mimic people talking they're very talented vocally affliction again i'm sure this is something that came from farmers a scourge or a constellation and they come in such huge numbers that um they when they are um Dealing with a predator, for example, a hawk or a falcon, they will do these incredible patterns called murmurations where uh, they all stick together and fly in these in these huge flocks that almost darken the sky. And it, they're just worldwide known for these kind of beautiful undulating um, murmurations of starlings. And I'll look at some a little later on, on some YouTube videos, but... Uh, that's probably how they're best known now is for their murmurations. So, as I said, starlings are often considered a problem bird in North America because one thing they compete 
for nesting cavities um, with our native birds, such as bluebirds and woodpeckers, and sometimes they even kill some of the native birds. They're also very aggressive at bird feeders, and this is certainly what we have noticed here at Dunrovin. They keep some of the smaller birds away and consume huge quantities of both seeds and soot, and indeed we can attest to that. And then, of course, these enormous winter foraging flocks can just decimate agricultural fields. And, and so people really don't want to see starlings in their area. And these um, huge winter roosts can also present, you know, a hygiene and even a noise challenge if they occur where people um, are. So interestingly enough, if you go to Audubon, they have a number of rules and birdist rule number 72 is it's okay to dislike some birds. And as you can see, the example that they give is the is the poor European starling who is much maligned in North America. And I think it, it's kind of interesting because of all the um, species that have taken over the world and traveled the most, we humans can certainly uh, lay claim to that. And yet we, we have to, <laughs> you know, um, pass judgment on other species that do the same. So I think it's rather kind of interesting. So, um, there, uh, and looking at starlings, I learned a couple of things I didn't know from before. Uh, they look different depending on the season. Now, these two here are young ones, and you can see their spots are just starting to form. And we commonly see the young ones on the osprey's nest as they emerge from the basements where some of the starlings have their um, nests. It's a very advantageous place for the starlings to have a nest because the ospreys keep the other birds of prey uh, from attacking. But I didn't completely understand uh, before looking into this that the yellow beak and the really iridescent um, feathering is something that is associated primarily with the breeding season. So this is the way a starling, a mature breeding adult starling, looks in the summertime, but they look, or, or the breeding season, but they look quite different in the non-breeding season, which is the way we see them now. And as you can see on the chest, they have these white dots now. They lose the um, yellow on their beak. They, they, they change considerably between the breeding season and the non-breeding season. I had not been aware of that, and I'm really glad to know that now. Okay, I wanted to show you a couple of uh, videos taken here at Dunrovin. The first one is simply uh, a small um, flock, or I'm going to call it a chattering, of uh, starlings that come to uh, the osprey's nest. And this just happened a few days ago, so let me show you what we've got here. So I condensed a starling's coming and going over a six minute period into just a couple of minutes. And you can see they, they come a little mob and then they go and then they all come back again. They come, they went. And here they come again. If you look on the top of that railing, they seem um, evenly spaced, which I find very interesting. There's a long little sparrow. <laughs> a 
Okay, in this next section, I slowed everything down. For one thing, you can see that they arrive at the perch from various directions. If you slow it down, you can actually see them fly in. And uh, watch the valley as they, as they almost like airplanes coming in. But you can see they come from many different directions. This is not something you'd necessarily notice until you slow it down. You can see them come in, in over the trees and over the pastures. It look like airplanes about to land on a carrier. They're quite pretty in flight. Okay, this last section I really slowed down. I want you to take a look at the individual birds, particularly over on the left-hand side of the railing there, how they jockey for position. It's, it's kind of interesting. I didn't really notice this until I slowed it way, way down. And you'll see them posture to one another. Here comes a bird from behind that's going to try to land up here, and it's going to set off a chain reaction. Look at the look at them posturing at each other, and the, and the posturing just seems to go right on down the line. Okay, so the next little film I have is a close-up. Uh, yesterday morning's light was really nice. It was kind of a flat light. You could really uh, get up on top of a bird to show you the different uh, parts of its uh, colors on its many different feathers. And um, this guy was fairly good about standing still while I caressed him with the camera to get some really good close-ups. But it's amazing these birds look, you know, completely dark from a distance, and yet their colors are really vibrant and very um, varied. they got a, kind of a blue-purple to a green, um, you know, to this lovely brown that's on the tip of its feathers. A very um, beautiful bird, actually, I think. So then I, I tried to go right up in uh, to the feathers. And this guy cooperated for a little bit. He let me get up uh, close for a, a while. But you can see the under feathers as well as the, the top feathers. Really interesting. Little white specks on the, on the ends of the feathers on the chest. And the head. Even a little bit of his underfellows and he fans them out for us. He did a nice job for us.
Okay. I thought at this point I would um, take you to some YouTube videos because um, there's some really fun stuff on YouTube about starlings. And this particular um, YouTube is a, um, a captured um, starling or probably a rescued starling, a starling that had been raised by a family. And you can hear a lot of the different variations of its abilities to um, to mimic. What do you think? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? it would be fun to um, learn a little bit about these murmurations, which are really fantastic to watch, but it raises a lot of questions of, as to how these birds do what they do. So this um, YouTube video really gives us uh, uh, some information on that. Few things in today's world cause us to pause our technology-driven lives and just look up. But if you noticed a dark cloud darting across the sky, assuming a variety of different shapes and movements, that might just do it. No, you're not tripping on psychedelics. These are real, and the science behind them will blow your mind. Massive aerial stunts are called murmurations, and they're made up of hundreds to hundreds of thousands of tiny birds called starlings. For years, all humans could do is watch in awe as a complete mystery took place above. But with modern technology that can keep up with the bird's activity, we're finally able to answer some of our biggest questions. Like, how do all these birds coordinate with each other? What do their movements have to do with the laws of physics? And why is this dance the key to their survival? Have you ever tried synchronized swimming or even choreographed dancing of any type? It's very difficult for humans to move in unison with each other. And for the most part, we're just talking about a few of us, not thousands. So how do these birds make it look so easy? How do they make it look like they're all part of one single mass? Do they plan and rehearse their patterns beforehand? Until recently, it was hard to say. But now, with high-powered cameras and computers, scientists have been able to make sense of the phenomenon. The first thing they learned is that the flying patterns have more to do with it up, right? Okay, for those of you who aren't physicists, a critical transition can be thought of as an abrupt change that occurs when an external force pushes something to its tipping point. Think of it like this. The giant group movements of a murmuration aren't happening because of any communication between the birds. They're a physical reaction. When an external factor, like an incoming predator, causes one bird to move in a certain direction, that bird bumps into the others around him, causing a massive change of course. It's like when an earthquake triggers the same kind of reaction in the snowflakes of an avalanche. Or a strong heat source turns liquid into gas. One bird affects the seven closest surrounding birds, and each of those birds' movements affects their seven neighbors, and so on throughout the entire group. This is why a murmuration can appear to have several moving parts, each with a slight variety in speed and direction. But what's the point of it all? Why are all these starlings gathering in one location in the first place? Well, surprisingly, the reasons aren't too different from why humans gather in large groups. For one thing, they like to communicate with each other. Starlings get together to share information, 
like where to find good feeding sites. The large groups are also helpful for providing much needed warmth during long winter nights and for defending against predators. Just like most species around the world, starlings find safety in numbers. When predators like peregrine falcons dive in for an attack, they find it much more difficult to target one bird when they're all spinning and turning together. Even the smallest murmurations will have about 200 birds in flight. The larger ones can contain hundreds of thousands. In 1999, there was one cluster recorded that consisted of more than 6 million starlings. Imagine trying to pick your next meal out of that. You're not likely to see one that big anytime soon, but smaller ones are fairly common if you look in the right places. Starlings start to gather in the fall, and they're usually seen in the early evening just before dusk. They tend to rest in places that provide shelter from harsh weather and predators, like cliffs and buildings. If you're ever lucky enough to see one of these in the flesh, keep your phone in your pocket and just enjoy it. Natural majesties like And I thought we would end with just a really fun sure. uh, it's helping uh, uh, more murmuration it's here that's, uh, that was taken in Rome. And the thing I like about this murmuration is you see it in a different uh, color because um, of the light, the sunlight. It's right at um, sunset, so they, it catches the iridescent colors. Winter evening, attracted by the heat of the city, Five million starlings stream into Rome. Before they roost, their maneuvers create nature's greatest aerial display. Their iridescent plumage is lit up by the setting sun. The word murmuration this comes. This spectacular performance isn't for fun. The, the peregrine falcon is looking for his evening meal, and he's hunting the world's best formation flying team. Where the word, word murmuration comes from is the beating of the wings, the noise that you're hearing. Their mesmeric waves confuse the peregrine. He can't lock on to a single target. To achieve such synchrony, each starling shadows seven of his nearest neighbors. They react ten times faster than any human pilot. To stand a chance, the peregrine must up his game. Despite his best efforts, the peregrine has been outmaneuvered and outperformed. For the starlings, city life is just for the winter. They will soon head for the wilds of Siberia to breed. There is a huge fundraising deadline coming up for Senate Democrats, and they need your help right now if they're going to meet it. I learned something about, um, you know, a bird that we see all the time, and yet um, we kind of take for granted because it is a common a bird, and we malign it much, but I think it's a really interesting bird and a beautiful bird and on the uh, Monday Social website.
Well, I don't see any uh, comments or questions. So with that, I'm going to say um, good afternoon. I enjoyed sharing the starlings with you, and I look forward to seeing you again uh, next week for some more bird action here at Dunrovin. And I'm going to join you a little bit later, uh, around 5 o'clock, for some horsing around. So stay tuned, and we'll be back then. Thank you all. Goodbye.